Awesome. All right. Thank you, everyone. Hello to our speakers and our attendees. Um, welcome to this panel. We're really happy to have you all. And I really look forward to the amazing discussions that I know are going to take place here today. <clears throat> so I'd like to start with the land acknowledgement first, and then we'll talk about the project and get going. We respectfully acknowledge that the land in which we are occupying is the unceded and ancestral homelands of the Beotuk, and that Uktamguk, known as the island of Newfoundland, is the homelands of the Mi'kmaq and the Beotuk. We would also like to recognize the Inuit of Nunatsiavut and Nunatukavut, and the Inu of Natasaman as the original people of Labrador. This acknowledgement is a commitment we practice in action, striving for respectful relationships with all peoples across Turtle Island. So for those of you who don't know, the Art as a Tool for Change project started in October and runs to the end of March. And it explores how art uh, can be used to inspire and promote social change and justice recognizing art as an empowering tool to facilitate critical dialogue around issues uh, such as anti-racism, feminism, 2S, LGBTQIA plus rights, environmental activism, and so many more. Um, working with the Eastern Edge team, we have selected our project curator, Bushra, who's here with us today. And um, through consultation with our three project artists, uh, Ethel Brown, Nassim Makaremi Nia, and Violet Drake. Um, we have worked collaboratively in this self directed residency to provide resources, space, and support for them to present their work in the group exhibition titled Between Here and There, which is available to view until tomorrow. Tomorrow is the last day of the exhibition, and it's also available online. Uh, I'd like to thank our funder for their support on, on this project. And uh, they are the Canada Arts Presentation Fund or CAPF. So thank you for that. And we are happy to be hosting the Art as a Tool for Change Symposium. And would like to thank our guests, everyone involved, and our speakers. Tomorrow is the last day. Check out our website for the other events and stay tuned for updates on the project. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Daisy. Daisy Jeffries is a sixth generation white settler artist, writer, and researcher born and raised in the Bay of Excellence on the northeast coast of rural Uktamuk, known as Newfoundland. Working with archives, found beach materials, queer ephemeral, oh, Daisy, <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> queer ephemera, there it is, oral histories, sound, poetry, sculpture, theory performance and illustration, her research-based creative practice engages with the ocean as a body of loss to form washy, wayward, and withheld counter-narratives of trans and sex worker histories at the water's edge. What emerges from this precarious assemblage is a story of time, drift, and transition that finds hope in the changing North Atlantic. Her research creation and multidisciplinary projects have been exhibited at Eastern Edge, the Rooms, Unscripted Twilling Gate, Inverness County Center for the Arts, and Cape Breton University Art Gallery, as well as performed widely at festivals, theaters, and house shows in St. John's, including Old Fast, Lanya Vanya, Femme Fast, and Out of Earshot. Daisy is the co-author co of Autoethnography and Feminist Theory at the Water's Edge, Unsettled Islands. She has recent publications in the Journal of Folklore Research, Feral Feminisms, Riddle Fence, Held, the Dalhousie Review, and ARC. Daisy, I'd like to hand it over to you. Thank you, Rachel, for the warm introduction, and thank you all for joining us today to talk about archives and histories. I'm really excited to have the chance to talk about this work. Um, we're bringing together a great group of folks today. I'm so happy that we also have a number of attendees um, who will help enrich our discussions as we think about the past, the present, and the future, um, the relationship between archives and artistry, uh, issues of evocation, um, response, um, ethical, political engagements, intimacies, distances um, with, with temporality. Um, so we have a keynote from Bushra Junaid, 
Um, and then we're going to have panel um, presentations from three artists, Fane Barra, XL Gray, and BG Osborne. And then we'll get into um, a, a Q&A session um, for any questions at the end. So I'm really excited for our conversation today. Um, you know, I, it's an honor to talk about our various engagements. And with that, I would like to welcome Bushra Junaid um, to offer our keynote. Thank you very much, uh, Daisy, and thank you to Eastern Edge um, for inviting me to have, to be part of the um, Art as a Tool for Change uh, project. It was an honor and a privilege to uh, participate and to be here today. I'm joining you from the Treaty 13, also known as Toronto or Takaronto, which is home to and meeting place of many Indigenous peoples from across uh, Turtle Island. I want to acknowledge the diversity of the first peoples of this area, the Huron Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. So through my artistic and curatorial practice, I've, I have attempted to gain insight about perspectives that are missing from uh, dominant art histories and to um, portray them or, or unpack them. Um, and in the recent past, I've worked on uh, worked with archival images of women and children um, uh, from the turn of the last century and curated a couple of exhibitions. So I'm going to talk about that today. But first, uh, I'm going to share an image with you. Um, I hope I can do so successfully. Share screen options. Um, and are you seeing this image on the on your screens? Somebody? Yeah. Anybody? Okay, great. <laughs> All right. So um, I'll just keep it in there for you. So I'd like to start with an image. Um, in this image, you see uh, three Caribbean children uh, in a sugarcane patch on a hot, uh, cloudless Sunday afternoon. A toddler in a simple shift sits on a bed of dry reeds that crunch underfoot, gumming a piece of the sweet, fibrous plant. A female figure, perhaps the baby's mother, stands behind them in a long, loose, white cotton skirt, top, and waistband, her face obscured by the picture frame. A girl of about seven, wearing a bonnet and clean white cotton dress, faces forward, gazing sidelong to her left as she sucks on a joint of cane. A boy of nine or ten, in worn work clothes, faces obliquely to the left, he grips a stalk of sugar cane with his left hand while bent, uh, his bent right arm rests a crude steel cutlass on his right shoulder. The boy's supple hands are strong, strong from hard work. His tool at the ready, he will deftly swing and sever another length of cane, offering a segment to anyone who wishes to continue drinking their full of delectable nourishing juice. Eventually, he will cut as many stalks above the root as he can manage, lash them together with cane leaf twisted rope, and hoist the bundle onto his head to ferry home. A tightly bound coil of fabric sits atop his head in anticipation of balancing the load. Over the girl's right shoulder, barely perceptible, a woman wearing a headscarf peers watchfully from behind the cane. I am captivated by the image of children from my grandparents' generation. I want to know more about the social, cultural, economic, and historical conditions that shaped them. What was the life of a black child in the Caribbean nearly 70 years post-emancipation? Did these children go to school, and where did their schooling take place? Did they learn by rote, balancing a small piece of wooden frame slate upon their knees, drawing lines with sim a similar piece of slate before carefully forming uh, their letters or, or numbers. 
And what was life like for this boy? What chores did he have to do before school if he went? Would he go to the field to help his father plant? Did he collect firewood or harvest yam or other rations for his mother to cook? Did he come home for lunch and perhaps bring his father's meal to him in the field in a carrier? After school, did he go back to the field or trek to the river for a cool dip and to collect water for cooking, washing, or laundry? And what of the girl who would soon have to fetch uh, water, learn uh, to cook, wash, launder, cross-stitch, ham and sew, keep house, look after young, younger siblings and, and, and braid hair? And in the evening, when all the chores were done, what was their leisure time like? What games did the children play? What songs and stories were shaped, were shared in the, in the heat of the night as culture was passed on from one generation to the next? What were the life possibilities and aspirations of these children? I try to discover what I can about their lives, the short fiction, novels, and essays of older and contemporary generations of Caribbean writers, social history, and music. I also glean from my Jamaican mother's stories of her own carefree childhood, playing, laughing, running, skipping, and doing age-appropriate chores before school, of not developing the knack of carrying anything on her head, instead clasping the pail of water with both arms and shimmying downhill on her bottom, of getting lost in your imagination without television and radio, of spending time with her maternal great and great-grandmothers. If you were sick, you mostly depended on home remedies, ginger tea, orange tea, peel tea. If you didn't have a mother or father or caring relatives who were caring, uh, or relatives who were caring, you'd more or less bring up yourself. The photograph, to Piccaninny's Candy Store, was published by the Pennsylvania-based Keystone View Company in 1903 as part of a box set of stereo views documenting sugarcane production that included images of cane fields, farm equipment, machinery, tools, and workers. Keystone and other companies produced millions of these photos, as well as affordable handheld stereoscopic viewers that gave people a 3D glimpse of exotic people in far off lands. Like all stereo views, this image was produced for commercial purposes as a way to entertain, amuse, and educate. Keystone chose to uh, title the, the photograph with the pejorative caricature of black children, Piccaninnies, to denigrate the subjects. North America's perceptions of black people, their history and culture were shaped in part by such stereo views. I intervened in this image by collaging contemporaneous ads from the St. John's Evening Telegram for sugar, molasses, rum, and other commodities onto the children's clothing. I enlarged the image to almost life-size proportions, so like six feet by 10 feet, and I renamed it Sweet Childhood. In doing so, I wanted to reclaim the image and to reflect on the lives of children of my grandparents' era and those who preceded and followed them by drawing a direct connection between these children and the forces that shaped them and my own bittersweet upbringing in St. John's in the 70s, my work is also a reparative act of searching for belonging. I'm a Toronto-based artist and curator who grew up in, with immigrant parents from Nigeria and Jamaica. My Jamaican uh, mother moved to Montreal in the late 1950s where she met my Nigerian Yoruba father, a student my parents moved to St. John's in the late 1960s, where my father was a professor at Memorial University. My four siblings and I grew up in St. John's. Growing up in Newfoundland and uh, Labrador was a unique experience with its strong, tight-knit culture uh, formed by the hard scrabble life and harshness of the environment. At home, we were enveloped by our mother's warmth and love, her Caribbean sensibility and way of being, her colorful expressions, beautiful singing voice and unbridled laughter, bedtime Bible readings and Jamaican folk tales. I was blessed to have a mother who was a terrific cook and whose wonderful food immersed us in African and Caribbean culture 
She elevated the traditional Newfoundland capelin recipe by cooking it with onion, hot pepper, herbs, and vinegar to make escovitch fish. She prepared salt fish with the occasional cherished can of ackee. And she made uh, stewed chicken and fish and rice and peas and mouth-watering corn pone of cornmeal, coconut milk, raisins, cinnamon, nutmeg, and allspice. And there were always aromatic curls of orange peel hanging from the kitchen cupboard doorknobs and warm mugs of cocoa tea. At school and out in the world, we experienced Newfoundland's food. Jigs dinner, fish and brews, ch chips dressing and gravy, cod tongues, runcheons, toutons, fried bologna, baked apple, and all manner of baked goods. Strong culture, brilliant humor and use of language, and its rich folk traditions. I'm grateful to experience both these strong island cultures of Jamaica and Newfoundland. However, my siblings and I grew up in the 70s without extended family, and there was little representation of black people in the media or popular culture. There were no black teachers, role models, or mentors outside our immediate household, and I was always the only black child in my, in my class. We were taunted for the color of our skin and constantly told back to go back to where we come from. There were persistent incidences, large and small, that reminded us that we didn't fully belong. We certainly weren't taught in school how our family's African-Caribbean history intersected with Newfoundland and Labradors, and so there was a sense of erasure, precarity, loss, and rootlessness. Over the years, my siblings and I moved to Toronto and Dartmouth while my mother remained in St. John's. As she got older and the time came for her to move closer to her children on the mainland, the realization that my mother leaving meant an end to my family's 50-year history in Newfoundland and Labrador triggered a crisis of belonging that I needed to explore through art making. In 2014, I initiated a multidisciplinary project that examined connections between Newfoundland and the Caribbean. I collaborated with independent curator Pamela Edmonds to present Newfound Lands, a project exploring historical and contemporary connections between Newfoundland and the, and the Caribbean diaspora at Eastern Edge and other venues around the city. Newfoundlands considered economic, social, linguistic, and other connections and presented the work of 10 Ontario and Newfoundland-based artists. The Newfoundland-based artists were Angela Baker, uh, Tamara Segura and Anita Singh. It included performances, exhibition of artworks, lectures, and a Newfoundland Caribbean fusion dinner. For the Newfoundland project, my research reflected on commodities traded between there and the Caribbean, including sugar, molasses, rum, and salt fish, and among other things, um, archival ads from Newfoundland newspapers. I interviewed, intervened in a stereo view of two Caribbean women, two pretty girls I met in a cane field in the same way that I described with, sweet, with the image Sweet Childhood, collaging historical ads on their clothing, enlarging it to unintended scale, and renaming it Two Pretty Girls. For a related photograph called Sisters, my sister and I donned Victorian dress and emulated the pose of the two women in the stereo view photograph to dramatize our shared African Caribbean Newfoundland identities. Through ongoing research, it became clear to me the extent to which black history is an inextricable part of Newfoundland and Labrador history. However, I didn't see this history or these connections represented explicitly in new provincial museums, archives, institutions, or the educational system. Archives and archeological records show that enslaved black people existed in the early settlements of Newfoundland and Labrador, and includes the territory's role in the centuries long transatlantic trade, purpose built slave ships constructed in uh, there, um, 19 of them are documented in the Transatlantic Slave Trade Database and transported 5,798 captured African men, uh, women and children from Western Africa to the Americans, Americas where they were enslaved on plantations and labored over centuries to produce cotton, sugar, molasses, and rum. And uh, that was traded between the Caribbean, North America, and Europe. The most inferior grade of Newfoundland and Labrador salt fish, which was unfit for any other market, was used as a cheap source of protein to feed the enslaved. 
and much of the salt used to preserve codfish before the advent of refrigeration was mined by enslaved African people on islands like the Turks and Caicos. My own foremother, Sissa, who was only, a, was only a teenager when she was forcibly brought from West Africa to the Caribbean in the hold of a slave ship. I don't know exactly when or on which vessel she may have made that uh, perilous middle passage journey, but perhaps it was on one of those ships constructed in Newfoundland and Labrador. In 2019, the rooms uh, invited me to curate an exhibition alongside the work of British Ghanaian artist John Acumfra. Uh, his work was uh, called Vertigo Sea. And I first encountered uh, this work in 2015 when it was commissioned for and presented at the 56th Venice Biennial by the late Nigerian curator Okwi and Wesor. I was so moved by Vertigo Sea that I kept going back like day after day for several days to be immersed in the sights and sounds of this multi-channel video. Every time I was enthralled by how Comfort managed to collage together iCarvel and newly shot film footage and incorporated voices reading from classical literature and contemporary migration stories to present his epic tale about humanity's relationship to the sea and its place in the history of whaling, migration, conflict, and slavery. At one point, Newfoundland 1497 flashed up on one of the screens in Vertigo Sea in reference to John Cabot's discovery of and claim to the territory for Britain. I envisioned the work presented at the rooms with the Atlantic Ocean right outside. Alongside a durational performance by the Trin uh, Trinidadian uh, and Tobagonian um, artist M. Nurbesi Philip of her uh, epic uh, poem called Zong, which the Zong recounts the, a massacre um, on a slave ship. Uh, in the late 1700s. And so seeing Vertigo Sea bolstered the course I had, from, uh, had um, set myself with the Newfoundlands project to research and represent how intricately intertwined African and Caribbean uh, history is with that of Newfoundland and Labrador. I also reflected on the cultural forms that Africans had carried with them on their journey to the new world, the languages, art practices, music, dance forms, and other skills. I read British, uh, Black British philosopher Paul Gilroy, who advanced the notion of the Black Atlantic to speak about the contributions of African descended people to shaping the new world. This background informed my curatorial pro approach I also spent time in deep contemplation of the ocean and the land while visiting the province. I decided to draw one thread from Acumfra's work, that of slavery in the Middle Passage, and to connect that with Newfoundland and Labrador. I'm grateful to uh, M. Norbessi Philip for influencing the, the exhibition title, What Carries Us, Newfoundland and Labrador in the Black Atlantic. So acting in conversation with Vertikosi's themes, uh, what carries us included video, mixed media, mural and photo based works by Canadian artists, Sandra Brewster, Shelley Miller, Camille Turner, and British artist Sonia Boyce, along with historical items from the room's collections. Sandra uh, Brewster's work referenced rum, sugar, and molasses in Caribbean cuisine, and recalled cultural and tra uh, food traditions that are shared between Newfoundland and, the, and Labrador in the Caribbean. Shelley Miller, uh, her work, uh, a sugar mural called Trade, um, reinforced or recalled uh, uh, Newfoundland and Labrador's place in global migration and, and exchange over centuries. Camille Turner's film and installation, Afronautic Research Lab, um, meditated on the 19 uh, slave ships constructed in Newfoundland that I mentioned a short while ago, and ballast, uh, which was used to weigh these displacement vessels down for their transatlantic voyage. And Sonia Boyce uh, had a video called Crop Over, which commented on historical and contemporary significance of the Caribbean Harvest Festival called Crop Over, which dates from slavery and, and shared European and Caribbean cultural traditions. So, I, and I also used artifacts from the room's collections and archives in the exhibition. So the remains of a 19th century British sail, sailor, um, objects from a 19th century uh, shipwreck, that sort of showed the, the taste of the merchant class. And in doing that, I was trying to sort of contrast or show how, you know, you know the, 
most Newfoundlanders and Labradorians were eking out a, a living fishing and enslaved people were laboring on plantations um, and both of us being both being caught up in a system of oppression that exploited their labor. I used many, used many other, you know, ads from the Evening Telegram from the 1870s to 1910s, you know, uh, geography textbooks, runaway slave ads and other items to show this historical connection. Um, it was my hope that that exhibition would encourage people to read between the lines of established histories and to open further uh, lines of investigation about the province's black history. But in the process of examining archival materials like letters and wills and deeds, merchant ledgers, parliamentary transcripts, newspaper ads, and so on, I discovered that the, the voices of African descended people that I'm trying to access are rarely available, um, especially the voices of women and children. So I'm, I'm attempting to uh, find alternative way, uh, alternatives to traditional archival materials to gain better understanding of the people in the stereo views I've used in my work. And one of those ways is to treat these images like family portraiture and to attempt to pull out the oral histories and stories within them by exploring the ways that my, my own family's histories and cultural traditions connect to the people in those stereo views. Archives tend to raise more questions than they reveal. And for the most part, they give the perspectives of those who were in power. What's missing are the voices of those who couldn't read or write or whose stories weren't recorded. I'm also interested in how black presence or survival is revealed through our food ways and other cultural traditions. So I'm attempting to bridge historical and archival research with my own artistic imagination and to allow my questions to lead me. I'm early in this journey, but uh, working with archives for me is about questioning, describing, inscribing, recovering memory or remembering, embodying, fabulating, you know, all in an effort to, to be, you know, to be alive and to thrive. And where the archives are silent, I'm taking an archival image and trying to give it voice. I'm also adding my own voice to the image. Through this work, I'm attempting to recover the lost history of my ancestors and doing so to make a place for myself. And uh, so it's been a real privilege to uh, work with um, Ethel, Violet, and Nassim and, and with Rachel and the, the Eastern Edge staff on the uh, art for, as a tool for change project. Um, to be working with artists who are also looking at issue uh, ideas of identity, belonging, and in-betweenness of uh, trying to, um, who are also on a journey of belonging and becoming. And so that has been a, a very, um, I've, I've learned and gained more from them than, uh, than I'm sure I've, I've brought to them. But um, for me, um, art is a tool. Uh, art is a tool for change. Is a way for dealing with the historical and and recent past and the present, and to offer you know a, some um, ways to access care, repair, and empowerment uh, to make meaning of our experiences within the context of the social and cultural and economic and historical forces that have shaped us. And through this inquiry, to learn to reflect deeply and to allow our natural curiosity, intuition, and joy, which may have been uh, dampened or by circumstances of, you know, whether that be poverty, neglect, abandonment, abuse, ableism, homophobia, transphobia, racism, or just, you know, trying to survive in this world, to emerge or to reemerge, to strengthen our ability to frame and express ideals conceptually and materially, um, at a per personal level, level, hopefully, but also to get to a point where our past experiences don't limit or uh, prevent or um, limit our presence or future possibilities. Um, and where our experiences or reality can be translated across space and time to have meaning and make a change for ourselves and others. Yeah, so I think I will leave it there and I thank you again for for um, inviting me to speak today. Thank you so much, Bushra, for that powerful keynote um, and raising questions about so many pertinent themes to archival relationships. 
um, issues of belonging, you know, your language um, that gestures toward a crisis and journey of belonging, um, representation, erasure, reclamation, repair, um, possibilities and impossibilities, emergence, reemergence, um, narrative and story, traditions, persistence, power. And I love the question of perhaps, right? When we gesture toward past that might have been, but for which there might not be a record or document, but the significance of that perhaps, and also for highlighting the, the interconnectedness of past, present and future. So next I would like to invite Fani Berra. Hello. Um, shall I just start or? Oh, I can hear you. Sorry, um, I decided against reading out uh, the bios that you folks provided, um, but we can link to the, the page in the chat comments if folks would like to read the bios. But if you would like to begin. Thank you. And thank you for inviting me to talk today. Uh, it's an honor to be among all of you. Uh, thank you so much. And um, yeah, I'll begin now. So, well, today I'm joining you from Oaxaca in Mexico. Uh, but this research and work has taken shape in the lands of the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and Muskim peoples, to whom I am deeply grateful. Uh, whatever we might be, it is crucial that we keep educating ourselves in the past and present stories of land dispossession, those who keep being affected, and the effects are seen across the globe. So what I am presenting to you today are writings and rewritings of what I consider my practice to be in relation to the archive. In this particular case, the photos contained in Through Newfoundland with the, ca Through Newfoundland with the Camera by Robert Edwards Holloway. So I pick up dandelions at the edges of the street, near a stream and at a dog park. Later, they will become a part of an archive, the archive of embodied displacement. The flowers will find a temporary home in apple juice and sugar. I am interested in dandelions because they remind me of the role of diasporas in history. From Latin, diasporin, diaspora means to disperse. Just like a wishful person or the wind, dandelions disperse and iterate. They adapt under challenging conditions. They are seeds and cedars, never meant to stay in the same place. Myself, I have moved between and across these points, Mexico City and Oaxaca, Cornerbrook and St. John's in Newfoundland, and then Vancouver. Like Mexican writer Olivia Terova asserts, the action of moving from one place to another multiplies the idea of the center, therefore canceling it. This characterization of motion as a creative of multiple centers serves to see the margins as a place from where diasporic people can operate. Terova writes, to migrate is to enunciate from multiple centers, to move from one place to another. A migratory way of thinking allows us to find ourselves in other stories, and with that, decolonize, depatriarchalize, and dehierarchize knowledge. This is a photo of the landscape between Mexico City and Oaxaca, a landscape I have come to know closely as I travel in between these cities. I might say this is one of my multiple centers. If we conceive margins as a place, we could perhaps observe the interrelation of space, people, and non-human elements and materials. In constant movement, I ask myself, how to document these journeys of belonging? Who has done it before? Have these stories been written in the first person? I believe that to name oneself a diasporic artist or person is to assume agency over our own writing and history. So I am not interested in indexing my story to a hegemonic narrative of the quote unquote past. As Rebecca Schneider in Performant Remain says, we have been doing so without really questioning the logic of the archive, a logic that begs for permanence and sees the document as the ultimate holder of the truth. In my work, 
I am interested in how we come to understand the collective memory of space and our bodies, understand how we come to inhabit time and land. Through my work, I intend to enact a methodology of care that it acknowledges the traces of my transits as I assume responsibility for my foreignness, my legal status as a temporary resident of so-called Canada, and my condition of uninvited guests to the lands I travel. The traces of my transits, what I have come to call diasporic gestures, stand bearing witness to the different adaptive processes I've undergone to understand a simple matter. As a diasporic person, where do I belong? I ask myself, is there a language that non-human speaks that I cannot listen? What's my role as a diasporic person transiting the land? To whom am I accountable to when there are multiple centers in my practice? I believe I am accountable to the space, people, and non-human elements and materials I work with. And these relationships were exacerbated by the pandemic. From supply shortages to the slow burn down caused by uncertainty, the edges of these elements were revealed to their maximum capacity. So making use of what was around me, I started my own archive, the Archive of Embodied Displacement. I had a book in mind to begin this journey. Through Newfoundland with the camera published over a hundred years ago and containing photographs of Robert Edwards Holloway. Holloway, an Englishman, scientist and professor at Wesleyan Academy in St. John's, traveled to different regions of what we colonially know as Newfoundland and Labrador to document the province. Initially, I picked this book from the rare section of the Memorial University of Newfoundland's archives, where and when I was an undergrad. It piqued my interest with its title, Uniform with the camera and not a camera, because this use of a definite article instead of an indefinite article invites us to reconsider the camera as a relatively new object. Once in grad school in Vancouver, I wanted to reconnect with the book as a way of a touchstone, to acknowledge the places I've been to and the new place I was trying to adapt. Alas, the initial shutdown happened, and I, like many other people, was prevented from reuniting. Missing the textures, the smells, and the careful protocol to console archival materials, I saw in this absence an opportunity to braid stories through careful gestures, intimately delineating the connection between nuance, nationhood, and the diasporic need of belonging in ever-shifting conditions. And... I started slow, with a stroll until I came upon a body of water. I picked up a rock filled with barnacles. Barnacles are marine anthropods, and they attach to all kinds of materials, including this hard like looking stone, boats, adrift pieces of wood, and whales. I see barnacles as an invitation to slow down. Of course, that is not what you want if you're a boat, and that's why they peel them off. But if you're a person, perhaps these anthropods might teach us to stay in place while everything else is moving, to observe who we are in relation to the things we attach to and their relation to us. For me, I am in relation to this rock and this rock is in relation to everything else. This relationality, the understanding of mine and this rock's place grew stronger when I came upon this image of a wash well with barnacles in Notre Dame Bay. In his book, Holloway photographed points of interest for tourists advertising Newfoundland and Labrador as a place to look at flora, fauna, icebergs, and indigenous peoples. This poses the questions, who holds the case in the relationships we establish? And to whom, who am I in relation to those stories already told from a colonial perspective? In thinking of you, I attempt to reconcile these questions in the form of temporary sculptural figures. In collaboration with the wind, pieces of paper stamped with the words thinking of you and then sewn together with a chain stitch float in the air as I move closer to the camera. Here, I believe the materials, the non-human and I were speaking. I felt like I was belonging in a temporary home, the wind. In a stranded in bed, I activate the archive in an intimate setting, inviting a stranded iceberg from over a hundred years ago to my bed, 
inviting it to the marginalia of temporarily belonging. Now I'm gonna share a part of that performance. Sorry, just a sec. Okay. No, 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 sorry. Okay. So once collected, these dandelions slowly became part of the jam. This is another way of archiving, relying on the temporal. This archive exists as it metaphorically and literally passes through your body. The, sub, the stories of the dandelion stand suspended in sugar and apple juice. The stories of diasporic subjects will become brute and iterate indefinitely. Thank you. Thank you, Fane, for those beautiful thoughts. I appreciate um, the conversation about multiplicities, de-hierarchized knowledges, assumptions, agencies, accountability, collective memory, traces, movement, capture and enclosure, ever-shifting conditions, attachments that circle around relationalities with humans and more than humans through time. Um, and I'm hoping we can extend the conversation about the archival gaze at the end of the presentations. Thank you so much. So I would like to invite Axel Gray to present next. Hello everyone, my name is Excel Gray, my pronouns are she. I am a Filipina Canadian diasporic settler occupying Mi'kmaq territory in Pocahontas, the land of the Mi'kmaq and Maliseet nations. These nations have an ongoing relationship to this land that transcends our concepts of ownership and possession. These nations also have valuable land-based autonomous knowledge systems that are incommensurable to settlers' way of life and how we perceive knowledge and education at all um, levels of education. Addressing our own relationship within ourselves is the first important step before realizing indigenous sovereignty. And we can do this simultaneously while showing up to call of actions and sending reparations to water and land protectors. I am interested um, in my art practice. I am interested in causing hesitation 
to create momentary reflective spaces that allows viewers to better understand prismatic contradictions and abject experiences of epistemic violence, fugitivity, time, and invisible labor, oscillation between queer phenomenology and hauntology as methodologies under a necropolitical lens foregrounds my personal practice. Um, and this is definite in my uh, memory of epistemic violence as a four-year-old um, maneuvering around uh, in the island of Cebu from Philippines. I remember um, there was somebody who is bakla, a term reserved for transgender um, femmes, uh, such as me, uh, was partaking in a festival underneath the Catholic Church, being uplifted by a bamboo throne while wearing a European um, glittery, very kitschy crown and draped in the blue garments of um, the Holy Virgin Mary. While she was being uplifted um, in contradiction of everything, uh, she was uplifted by many Cebuano people who are um, wearing indigenous regalia while operating in uh, problematic blackface. So I'm really interested in those many contradictions and how that arrive in the various contexts of, um, of the world and how I have arrived here. I am influenced by Akili Membe's Necropolitics, Spivax and the Subaltern Speak, Sarah Ahmed's Queer Phenomenology and the concept of hauntology by Jacques Derrida in my own framework. So hauntology is a concept of um, to live is to be, uh, to be possessed by hauntings of the past. And um, necropolitics is a lens or analysis coined by Akili Membe um, that states that to live in a colonized world is to live in a Manichaean world uh, full of binary dichotomies. And even the concept of liberal democracies uh, operate in a solar and a nocturnal democracy. And many folks, who are closer, whose bodies are closer to death, live in um, the nocturnal democracy. Uh, in his own words, um, the world is separated by those that are destined to live and those that are destined to die. Unraveling who gets to live and who gets to die reveals the machinations of how this world operates from state-sanctioned deaths, state-sanctioned um, violence and abandonment and multi-level institutional failures. So that concept of colonial and capitalist forces is reenacted um, time and time again as a form of haunt. And according to Ahmad, objects um, that possess, that we possess are not neutral. They arrive to certain spaces, various forces. Um, the reading of the objects depends on the person who possess these objects. So phenomenology is the study of experiences or phenomena. Um, I'm interested in how uh, the body, how my own body functions in a chair that is not made for me. For my art practice, the color ultramarine blue has fully hypnotized me. It's an amazing deep sea blue that's both alluring and repellent at the same time. The term ultramarine comes from the, uh, from the color ultramarine blue, which originates, um, which originated from the Latin term ultramarinus. It means from beyond the seas. It references the highly extracted mineral called lapis lazuli, which is known to decorate the body of the Holy Virgin Mary, especially during the Renaissance period. Most of the mineral originates from across the seas inside the mines of Afghanistan. Due to scarcity, it is no longer sustainable to use the expensive mineral as the main ingredient to create the hypnotic color blue to meet modern cultural demands. These days, synthetic ultramarine is composed of various minerals to emulate its original predecessor. So that emulation is also another form of hauntology. While the synthetic cousin is non-toxic, the production of its composition was invented by Jean-Baptiste Guimet in 1826, continuously produces a variety of toxic fumes and wastes. I am interested in this color because blue is the color of death, sadness, and the unknown. 
It is the color of where the depths of the sea and the vastness of the cosmos meet. Ultramarine blue is the color of the skies um, in transition before the sun rises and after the sun sets. There is exactly 12 hours difference between the time here in Halifax and the time in the Philippines, sometimes in the morning at 6 a.m. I look at the sky before the sun rises and wonder what is happening on my island, the Philippines at 6 p.m. after the sun sets. During this moment, time and space blurs and everything becomes blue. Through this color, I wish to communicate feelings of melodrama, hauntings, fugitivity, invisibilized labor, unstable time, and the constant state of transition for many bodies. I think this color is interesting because I live in the port city of Halifax, where many people, objects, and cultures um, arrive in contradiction to this land. So this painting is called Buy It With a Teardrop Earring. The title of this painting references the Baroque painting tradition of naming like girl with a pearl earring. And the term bayot is a Bisaya or Cebuano specific term for bakla. Uh, both terms are used to describe femme gender variants in the context of many groups in the Philippines. In this painting, you can see a figure represented by rush and um, swirls of paints. Their body is an outline by translucent ultramarine blue. The body was then interrupted by meticulous slicing to allow weavings of the same material to be woven on their body. So it's an allowance of uh, letting a body um, adapt in many narratives and many different prismatic contradiction experiences. I am interested in portraying the body as ever-changing, forever malleable, but also flexible depending on their environment. Um, this body can always accept and welcome new narratives to weave and become part of the self. Um, the title of this painting is It translates to those who call for another world. Um, how I render this uh, painting is uh, it's in between abstraction and figuration. Uh, both hidden at first, then only visible when you focus on them. Um, so I really want to speak on that, uh, play on um, on that visibility and invisibility. Once you see them, you will see two figures laying down, reaching for the black void. Thus, it, uh, I really want to communicate diasporic longings and desires for another world. The symbols at the bottom of the painting is the result of pre-colonial scripts by Bayin and Badlit mixing with European letters, uh, Roman letters, Japanese hiragana letterings, and Chinese scripts. So it speaks to the constant state of mixing and various narratives combining with diasporic um, Filipinas. Um, and it speaks to the effects of globalization. What happens to these scripts is that it is no longer tangible and it's no longer, you're no longer able to read what they mean because of the constant mixing. Um, I painted ambiguous figures called uh, Not Like Us Humans from Cebuano folklore. These beings occupy spaces between multiple man-made dichotomies. Um, the unraveled figures are ambiguously rendered through paint while their environment is interrupted by meticulous, meticulous slicings through the canvas with similar materials woven in. These woven and unwoven characteristic gestures to how their ability shift forms allows them to connect and disconnect with others while disrupting the spaces um, they occupy. I recently, um, I will be now sharing shots of my first solo exhibition at the Anna Leon Owens Gallery in Halifax, Chipotok. All these photos were taken by Britt Shirley. Um, in, the, in this proposed solo exhibition titled I will always hide many things from you. I wish to explore themes of hauntings, melodrama, baroque excess, fugitivity, time, and invisible labor through a ne uh, necropolitical lens. The term gaba comes from the Sibisayan or Cebuano oral tradition of inflicting curses or summoning justice by alerting non-human entities or spirits called Dili Ingunato, which translates to not like us humans. 
about wrongdoers. So how um, Sebuanu people operate in the world is that they always uh, use the term Gaba and Guia um, to uh, talk about what forces embedded in uh, living and non-living objects. Alternatively, Guiag is a saying to preserve um, blessings by preventing the spirits from taking things back forcefully from those who they mistaken or misjudge to possess resources or qualities and excess. This pre-colonial concept paradoxically exists in everyday Catholic life, similar to my memories when I was four. So in this exhibition, I ask, what are the invisible forces and labors embedded in everyday objects? Here's a shot of the gallery. All of the blue objects are bathed in blue light. And in the background, as you move throughout the space, there is a choir that sings a lot of um, uh, a lot of traditional classical uh, music um, from various parts of uh, the Philippines. But how they uh, who sang, sings them are uh, are the sing them are from Russia, from China, Japan, Korea, Canada, New Zealand, and um, America, uh, and Ukraine and Russia. So all of these um, spaces exist, and all of these songs exist all over the world. So I ask the viewer, what happens when they paradoxically exist away from their clients? And um, it's interesting to me as well that uh, the concept of adapting things in a colonial context, such as a operatic Catholic choir, it becomes easier for folks to consume them for mass consumption. Um, and I really want to ask that because all of these songs have uh, various different uh, meanings and narratives embedded in, on them, and who gets to decipher which is which. So I collapse a um, sacred rain song in one of them that's sung by a Russian choir, and a song about a horny young lad um, in a uh, in a village. So the fact that folks can decipher those and they are um, embedded in a Catholic operatic sequence uh, erases their narratives or their subtleties or their meanings, and folks cannot tell the difference of which is. And here is a um, a scene of the playlist of uh, the a Russian choir singing Dombele, which is a sacred rain song. I'm also interested in boxes because boxes uh, as an aesthetic um, contains so much. It alludes to labor and globalization's arriving of uh, cultures and objects, resources to distant lands. And I really wanna to speak to the Filipino connection to boxes because there is a, um, there is a tradition called the Balik Bayan boxes, which means to return home boxes. It is a tr tradition that was born due to economic influences um, from the 1970s. Um, and many, uh, during the 1970s, during the Marcos era, uh, the Philippine government has used its people as um, uh, labor, knowing fully that they will send resources back home to uplift the government. And I'm interested in um, about the concept of the Balik Bayan boxes because sometimes these boxes get so large and exist in the living room in the space of a home and folks and bodies have to maneuver around them. And I want all of my paintings uh, to lean on these boxes and to lean on um, packagings. Um, so in a way, Balik Bayan boxes are kind of a, uh, a promise for folks who have traveled distant lands to their and send it to their families back in their islands to as a promise that I will return home, knowing fully that they will never return home. So here you have one of my paintings on top of colonial urns that features past house plants. I'm interested in the concept of uh, the possession of tropical objects and the possession of um, of resources for display. What does it mean for these uh, house plans that uh, exist elsewhere and paradoxically exist in homes, in banks, and um, structures 
what are the colonial forces that possess these uh, narratives and who is the gaze uh, for? Um, and you can see that my painting here, the narrative that's contained in this painting is uh, sitting on top of these urns to speak about the precariousness of being uplifted, but for whom? Because most bodies um, are usually uplifted uh, uh, for the purpose of maintaining various infrastructures and states, um, often Eurocentric ones. Here's another painting that's uh, blue. Um, all of these, all of these uh, slippery brushstrokes um, references uh, by Bayin and Badli script, scripts that is mixing with um, Japanese letters, Chinese letters, and various letters all across the world, and mostly predominantly European Roman letters um, to speak about the state of globalization. And after I paint them with different colors, I layer, I then layer uh, colors of ultramarine blue to speak about the seas of uh, globalization and speak about um, the effects of uh, transnational. Here you have Bakalat with a pearl, a bayou with a pearl, a teardrop earring. Um, she is hidden in a vase uh, that it that contains roses and lotus blooms um, and early and uh, bamboo because I want to speak about the paradox of combining multiple plants, combining multiple um, resources for the benefit of a single viewer. Um, what does it mean for roses to exist in contradiction to most lotus blossoms, which uh, which is native elsewhere in bamboo at the same time. And this uh, vase, I uh, procured it, I bought it from HomeSense. And a lot of the aesthetics of this uh, vase references um, South African diaspora design. So I really wanted to speak on um, who gains access to uh, exoticisms and who gains access to these narratives. And uh, I want to, um, hide the slicing that's embedded in the body of this painting through this lens of exoticism and the fact that this painting and this narrative of this painting is sitting precariously on the vase. Um, I do not want my paintings and work along on the gallery white walls because these narratives don't belong in these spaces. So I wanted to speak on the, uh, the tension of blue, the tension of transition, the tension of um, operating from one box to another, from one place to another. And what does that mean? And you have uh, a variety of objects here. Um, you have a globe that's uh, spray painted blue, um, orchids that are spray painted in blue and various tropical uh, fruits, um, pineapples, um, dragon fruit. Yeah, and I wanna speak of uh, who gets them and where do uh, they end up? I remember when I was a child, um, I come from a, a privileged background now, but during my childhood, um, the, my parents and I experienced so much economic precarity. Uh, and I remember a term um, where my mom said that I um, eat this piece of fruit because uh, it is export quality. Um, it implies that a fruit has two identities, one that is um, unwanted and one that is wanted um, of the global north. Uh, to speak of export, what does it mean to consume fruit that is not export quality and um, export quality? And in my work, I want to uh, connect blueness for many folks that are um, existing in diaspora in this group show, in this upcoming group show called The Tropical Gothic. The term was first coined by Filipino author Nick Joaquin in 1972. Um, the term Tropical Gothic came from a compilation of fictional short stories titled Tales of the Tropical Gothic. This literary work is a result of a historical moment of tumultuous social transitions due to uh, colonial forces violating autochthonous cultures. In Joaquin's work, the tropical Gothic as a nascent genre resists the imperialist ideology of its pre predecessor, infusing Philippine X folklore 
ways of knowing and doing in imaginaries into the Anglophone literary canon. The Gothic as a literary movement was born of European fears of the unknown. The Gothic summons imagery of cold bleak arid landscapes and castles or manors filled with melodramatic characters. Common themes in these settings are the sublime, romanticism, nebulous, nocturnal forces, hauntings, and demonic unknown antagonists. Conversely, tropicality invokes colonialist and escapist fantasies of sunny beaches, villas, jungles, plantations, and pleasures in regions of the global south. In this group exhibition titled uh, Tropical Gothic, these nocturnal and solar visions paradoxically come together to shatter common narratives in the archives. This work is a collaboration between me and Luba Gonzalez de Armas, who's a Caribbean diasporic writer, Carmel Farabaksh um, from uh, Shaya Ishak, Pamela Juarez, Cynthia Ares House, and Marissa Sh Thank you so much, Excel, for giving us so much, uh, leaving us with this and asking us to consider ideas of extraction, excess, export, colonial consumption, possession, hauntings, curses, afterlives, epistemic violence, reenactments through time, um, precarity and uplifting, again, drawing links here with Bushra's keynote. Um, so maybe precarity in the archives is something that we can consider as well. Um, temporalities of globalization being key, uh, this relationship with food and consumption. Um, so thank you. And we'll now hear from BG Osborne. Okay, let's see here. Share the right window. Hold on one second here. My screen sharing, can you all see that? Yeah, okay. Uh, one second. Okay. So hi, uh, I'm BG Osborne, or Beck, whatever you feel like calling me, I'm fine with whatever. Um, I wanted to start this presentation with some uh, uh, a note that I, uh, well, I guess like a class project I had written when I was about nine, which I always just thought was funny that I deeply identified with Ryan Gosling from Goosebumps. Um, and I always go back and forth wondering if it's I wanted to be him, as in like wanting to be a boy or having that specific freedom, or if I just wanted to have a really cool camera, because uh, it's from the episode Say Cheese and Die, where he just has a really cool Polaroid camera and gets into mischief. So let's see here. Uh, so a lot of my work in the past, I've been realizing it, there is common threads that kind of string everything together. I've been pretty withdrawn in the past couple of years due to autistic burnout and increasing mental health issues and, uh, et cetera. That's, those are the main things, I guess. But, um, I've been constantly interested in archives. I think my Initial reasoning for being drawn towards archives is that I don't have many memories before the age of 10, I would say. Um, and I'm really interested in familial archives as a way of like piecing together the beginning of my life that I don't have much recollection of. Um, so the piecing together though is it's always going to be fragments and I'm aware I'm never going to have a complete narrative. So this is a, a strange series that hasn't really left my computer. Um, I've been working on, maybe it'll become a book project at some point, but it's at this point titled Gay Interest. So I was on eBay, as I am often, uh, looking at random ephemera, and I always look at things that maybe I could, you know, maybe rescue or have a part of my archive in some way or just in like queer context. So I've looked up, I always look up things like gay, queer, trans, whatever. Um, and I stumbled across this uh, collector who had an entire, like hundreds and hundreds of photos that were all labeled gay interest simply because there were more than one men in, man in the photo. So I just became drawn towards these images. Um, 
and like the decision of like a stranger to like have all these photos uncensored and labeling them as gay for whatever specific reason maybe there's like like a certain level of intimacy she thought would be interesting to other people i was just really drawn to these images and i don't really have much to say about them beyond that right now but i just felt they were important to share because it's kind of part of this ongoing uh process of like cur just curiosity of what other people value and keeping or try to sell like she was selling these photos for like 15 dollars each so that was just something that i have had on my mind for a couple of years now um i always feel somewhat of a need to mention this project that was from 2016 to 2019. Uh, it's titled A Thousand Cuts. Uh, and it was just over the period of about six months, maybe a year compiling footage from uh, popular film and television of misrepresentation of trans people in popular culture. And just creating this triptych, overwhelming video uh, just kind of like showing the increasing frustration that I as a trans person and many trans people I know uh, with like the lack of genuine representation that we that we have. Uh, and this was paired with um, a scrolling list or a takeaway poster of all documented murdered trans people around the world to kind of get at the fact that through this mass archive of dominant media, this is not enough. And even with increasing trans representation that is more I would say more genuine with trans people in front of the camera behind the camera writing scripts uh, representation is always going to fall short uh, and it's not always it's not enough it's not giving us fully what we need uh, and then it kind of leads me to think about you know like the ease of access to how like how easily accessible this form of media is and then when I think of being an archivist and a media artist uh, and the ease of access I have to like video distribution centers such as VTape or um, uh, blanking on names right now. Uh, I'm a little nervous, <laughs> but um, we're, uh, just give me one second here. Um, I just I, I find it curious just like the how harder how much harder it is to access those like such important narratives and works by trans and non binary people that are within distribution centers, because a lot of people don't feel that they are accessible because it, you can't just click on your TV and find them so I've been just going back towards the thought of what it would be like to have. Uh, kind of like there was back in like the 70s and 60s and 70s more guerrilla television style channels and like having people like us being able to showcase our work in a way that dominant culture would just it would just be in their face sort of thing um i would say for the last over the course of the pandemic i mean it's this has been a a thread in my work uh ever since i was i was young uh, has been this deep, deep interest in loss and grief and um, post-humanist collaboration. I've been thinking a lot lately um, about ways, I might just scroll through some of these photos because I don't have words for them right now. Um, just ways that I'm interacting with my family's archive and coming to terms with the loss of my mother 26 years ago now is and that grief does not go away so figuring out ways to i don't like using the word productive but like propelling like using that grief to kind of propel a new body of work that is collaborative even though she's no longer physically here and i'm still figuring out ways to talk about that and figure out what that's going to look like but uh it's just been this ongoing genuine interest and having this lack of information about this woman who was is so important in my life um but is no longer physically here um so her, she shows up in my work in a lot of different ways i would say um and looking having access to my family archives this has been something again i would go down into the basement for hours as a kid and just look through photos organize things try to piece together 
information like to replace the lack of memories that I have. Um, so I, I share these photos because it's like a deep connection I have with my godfather who's my mother's brother. Um, we were both alcoholics. I'm 705 days sober today. Uh, but I also just love this series because it's he's such a shit. Like, I'm sure he got in trouble for this. Um, and a couple of years ago, I started working with him on a collaborative documentary project called Protector. Uh, he was institutionalized at CAMH in Toronto in the late 60s, early 70s. It was then called the Addiction Research Foundation. Um, so this work has just been us getting to know each other better and like our the links we have between addiction and mental health and his experiences with dissociative identity disorder and just the lack of help that he received at a research facility. He was basically kept there for nine months and then they sent him away saying, you know, we did a bunch of research, but we don't know what's up. So we'll see you later kind of thing. Um, so this is somewhat of an ongoing project based on, uh, depending on what our capacities are at. Um, it's something we potentially want to revisit and get more in depth with. Um, this was also the back of a photo that always stuck with me. I'm not sure why cool dude is in quotes. Uh, this is my, my Audie's writing, my mother's mother. Um, so it just, again, is something that has resonated with me. Uh, not sure if I told her to write that or if it's something that she just came up with. And the photo on the right is an ongoing paused right now because I've recently relocated from Ontario to Newfoundland and have hardly any of my stuff with me, which as an archivist and person who collects things makes me very anxious not having a lot of my stuff with me. But the photo on the right is from this, just an accumulative process-based work called Aspirations, where every week when I do my hormone shots, I aspirate the needle onto a piece of paper and I like the way that it looks like constellations. So I just decided to keep doing that. Um, but yeah, this ongoing work that I've been trying to keep reactivating with my mom. Um, I just want to bring grief and death and like the, um, the experience of like going through losing like a very important person in your life, like bringing it out of the siloed experience and just into more community conversations. Um, and yeah, that's, I, I'm more open to like having questions and back and forth about this. I'm not a person who's very, uh, comfortable with just talking without having a, a bit more of a back and forth. So I'd just be curious to maybe see what it would mean to other people to have more work that is based on um, just like being more public with grief and how grief can be not just a damaging aspect of your life, but it can just be used in different ways. And that when people are physically not here anymore, it doesn't mean that they're gone. So and I'll end by, uh, I like to end with, as I start with kind of silly things from my childhood. Um, well, this is not the, that's not the slide. So this is just a couple of um, more contextualizing images from my mother's artistic practice and the work that we're, um, we're gonna hopefully be doing. Uh, I want to figure out ways to like integrate her ceramic work into a more, uh, into my work and we'll see how that goes. And I just like to share this photo as you can see, my teacher decided to correct uh, the spelling for one word, but not for this. So a snake is apparently an acceptable snack. So thank you, Beck, for all those thoughts about withdrawnness and memory and memorialization, fragments and ephemera, censorship, uncensorship, the agency of archival and personal bodies over materials and objects, curiosity, commodity, compilation, complication, misrepresentation, accessibility and value institutions and institutionalization. Um, I want to open, since we only have about eight minutes of official time, um, I wanna open directly to the attendees in the room. Um, to see if there are questions that can formulate a short um, discussion among the panelists.
And meantime, what's everyone's favorite color? Does denim count as a color? Yes. <laughs> Good. Denim blue. Deep, deep denim blue. Dancer, uh, dance is also a color in my book. My favorite color is dance. It's not blue. Mine is green. <laughs> Thank you for your question. <laughs> Mine is blue as well. So I guess I have a whole bunch of thoughts, um, but in the remaining time that we have, I'm just wondering if you folks have any um, things to add about access, um, access to, to institutions, um, and then accountability to working with with temporalities, with objects, um, with impossibilities. So if you have any thoughts about access and accountability. Uh, I mean, I just have a few like I will obviously speak from my experience. Like I'm, uh, you know, I'm white. I am cert like certified archivist um, artist. I know how a lot of um, video, I, specifically I'm thinking within media arts because those are the archives I tend to gravitate towards. Um, I've, I feel like I have an ease of access because I understand how those organizations work. Um, and although they are very, like, the staff are always very friendly, very welcoming, I feel like a lot of people who aren't maybe as knowledgeable of how those structures and systems work feel very off put by trying to access things behind, you know, it's, you can't access it online without contacting the organization first and getting a password and all those things set up and you often think you have to be like an academic researcher or in school or something like that. But so I think that's something I just like to bring up is that, uh, if you like for media art, specifically video art and film, um, if you know that a work is at a certain distribution center, uh, I encourage people to just contact people who work there because they want you to see the work. Um, so that's like something I try to think of as, as far as barriers and stuff. It's often, yeah, this, the, the organizations seem very uh, intimidating sometimes, but it's worth just reaching out. We could also bring things around to address Holly's um, comment in the chat about ontology and Excel's introduction of ontology and how um, questions about haunting um, apply to the different uh, conversations that we've heard today. also how this relationship between access and accountability um, registers kinds of haunting in itself. Well, um, maybe I'll talk a little bit about it. Um, kind of uh, going back to uh, Beck's uh, presentation on uh, family archives and to talk about about access and accountability like I um, like my family doesn't have an archive of photos um, because they're like they're, they didn't have the means to take those photos <laughs> uh, so there was no like camera there was no film and that part of even though I'm interested in archives, I have to look at other person's archives to sort of relate to <laughs> those stories. And I think that also goes back to Bush Press, like seeing in these images, I wrote it down because that was uh, really beautiful, um, to treat images as family portraiture. 
uh, like that's what I'm trying to do through my work. Like I'm looking at archives that might relate to the spaces I have inhabited just because they ground me temporarily into those spaces, but it's far complicated because I'm on an, an I'm, I am an uninvited guest to these peoples, but like uh, institutionally, I'm also a temporary resident. So I wouldn't say, and this is like an idea that has been in my mind and I gotta be more articulated about it, but I wouldn't say I am a settler because the state prevents me from belonging in a lot of ways, in, in, in terms of funding, in terms of what I can apply for, in terms of not having um, uh, like um, access to medical <laughs> assistance at times, depending on my visa. So I look at other people's archives in, in, in sort of trying to create a story that will make me be a part of something bigger than, <laughs> than myself. <laughs> Um, yeah, that's what I'll say. I can add to that um, with a quote by Nick Joaquin. If for us culture means museum and library, an open house and art gallery, for them it meant the activities and amenities of everyday life. The riff is between folk culture, where the unschooled can be wise, and print culture, which subjugated the other senses to just the eye. So I'm curious of how archives function as simply as I and that, I, uh, that space in, in between and um, like you lose a lot of information there. So I'm curious of how color and songs and tastes um, and how you maneuver around the gallery and change that relationship. But it becomes an archive of feeling um, because Ocean Vuong said something along the lines that is that what art is to be taught, thinking what we feel is ours when in the end it was someone else in longing finds us from on earth we're briefly gorgeous. So I'm really interested on um, who are other folks that are in longing. I just wanted to respond I, to um, Ali Johnson wrote, do the panelists see nostalgia in relation to their chosen archives as a position, as a positive or a negative in their work? Um, I just want to say for me, I don't feel that looking at my familial archives is necessarily nostalgia because that's longing maybe for ways that things used to be and I don't have that recollection. I basically my mother's archive and even like she exists as a character essentially when I was younger, um, only hearing stories about her through other people and she was kind of put up on this pedestal. Uh, and I feel like a lot of the work I'm trying to do and thinking is like just figuring out who I am as a person essentially and like how maybe I got the way I did based on the way the things and the trauma other members of my family went through. Um, so yeah, I don't see it. Not that I have a problem. I think nostalgia is, is, is wonderful in a lot of ways. I think it can be used positively. Um, um, I don't see it as a weakness in the sense or in the realm of contemporary art at all. Um, but yeah, I feel like this for me is just, you know, I, I make art to communicate and to make sense of things. Uh, yeah, that's, those are the only thoughts in my head right now. So. Does anyone else have any thoughts to add about nostalgia? I also have a question directly for Bushra from Jerry Evans. Um, so if, if folks want to talk about nostalgia, feel free, and then we might go into the question for Bushra. Um, maybe I'll just quickly say that for me, there's no nostalgia looking back at uh, Three Newfoundland with the camera because it was created by like a white person. So I'm not um, I'm not nostalgic of the places he depicted. I'm actually quite mad um, because the gaze um, that he had 
kind of Lord <laughs> Robert. Uh, yes, Emily. <laughs> uh, like the the way he depicts people and and flora and fauna are of course like um, a way of advertising Newfoundland as a place to look at uh, these places and never to belong. And then I'm coming from the other spectrum of like I do want to belong, but I do I do not want to belong to like this colonial narrative. However, I am complicit in it, <laughs> uh, and that is something that you battle with, uh, and that I try to enact through this methodology of care of looking at archives um, respectfully, but also having this critical view as to what you are consuming uh, to be part of your personal narrative. I think that's really interesting, Pon, because uh, uh, nostalgia can also be a uh, hauntology of wishing the way things um, are in the past, which is problematic because it erases um, the transitions and transgressions of the time. Uh, I'm really interested in the concept of longing as like longing for an alternative beyond where the sea and the cosmos meet through uh, the color of ultramarine blue of a constant state of longing, feeling blue. Um, yeah, because for many folks, uh, we all uh, operate in a series of um, ontology. Uh, yes, uh, Fawn, I feeling utopia instead of an actual utopia, because uh, I feel like uh, languages and narratives of utopia can be usurped by states um, in service of problematic uh, regimes. But I'm more curious about the feeling of utopia, a feeling of love. Thank you, everyone, for registering that question. And then I'll ask um, Jerry's question for Bushra. Jerry says, thank you all for your incredible work and for sharing your stories. Bushra, in your research, have you come across any information or snippets of any reference to the indigenous peoples of this place, Newfoundland and Labrador, the colonies, uh, the colonies called Newfoundland being a part of the slave trade? Were our people, indigenous peoples, captured and enslaved? I, I have seen um, some evidence in, um some wills and deeds that suggest that that talk about um, uh, indigenous um, slaves as well. Um, there's also a, a recent project. Uh, it's not a relation to um, Newfoundland and Labrador, but by Camille Turner and Kamal Perbe. Uh, it's a public art installation that they did um, about um, some of the the colonial uh, merchants and their uh, colonial houses and and using uh, enslaved indigenous and black people to uh, um, you know run those <laughs> those properties I could probably find, uh, share with you um, Jerry a link to that particular project and and some other references for you to take a look at We've gone six minutes over time. Um, I'm not sure if that's fine, if the gallery uh, would like to, to offer us some advice here. If there are no questions, okay, Rachel said it's okay. If there are no more questions, um, I really appreciate all those who, are, who have attended today and have shared the space with us as we consider and reconsider um, temporalities, transitions, um, responsibilities, reparations. Um, longings, losses, uh, as they relate to archives, past, presents, futures, um, the interconnectedness of these flows of, of power and subjugation. Um, thank you for being here. I want to ask the panelists again if you have any concluding thoughts. Thank you, Emily, for that comment. I just want to say it was nice to to meet people virtually and it was an honor to be on this panel with you and learn more about your work so likewise thank you so much for um, all of your generosity um, and thank you Eastern Edge Gallery for hosting this uh, wonderful uh, panel yeah thank you all for your uh, eye-opening uh, presentations, but 
I'll, I'll, I'll just say that sometimes being in the archive feels very lonely and being with you all makes me feel part of something and that's what I look for forward in my work to to belong and today was that opportunity so thank you yes thank you I would also say that uh, yeah it's been a real uh, privilege to hear from from everyone about your practice this afternoon and I'm gonna you know investigate further but I'm still sort of thinking you know about um, these ideas around you know the incl incomplete uh, archive or narrative and also about hauntology and um, the ways in which you become haunted by the you know by these uh, I don't know whether it's an ancestral memory or um, just in our you know desire to belong you get sort of taken up and carried along certain paths and and you know where is that um, where the self plays a part in this or or larger larger ancestral uh, embodiment um, plays a part in that so this is something I'm going to continue to chew on after this conversation. <laughs> Thank you again, everyone. And I, I feel the gratitude um, and it's been an honor to, to um, share in these conversations. So thank you again. Hi everyone, thank you for joining us and thank you to our wonderful speakers. Take care, enjoy the rest of your day. We hope to see you at the rest of our symposium events. <laughs> Bye.